Um, anyway, welcome everyone, and we're delighted to um, introduce you to Joe Isle today, Circular Programme Lead from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Uh, but I know actually he's been with them for quite a number of years <laughs> so, and quite a few different roles as well. So it will be really great um, to, to hear all of the different things that he's been probably involved with today. Um, as usual, we start by asking our guests to bring a uh, circular conversation starter. I don't know what it is. So first of all, welcome, Joe. Uh, Hello. What have you brought with you today? I've brought one of my Christmas presents. Oh, nice. Look at this. I was really happy with this. It's called uh, Tiptoe. And it's, uh, it's a table, or it's, it will be a table one day. Um, so these are table legs made of, uh, made of cast iron. And it's like a little vice grip. And I could, if when I found a nice piece of wood, or I guess you could find anything, I could, uh, I'll make myself a coffee table or a bench or um, a stool. I guess furniture is pretty much the main aim here. Um, but this, I'm, I'm very excited about uh, using these. As I have got four of them, by the way. I'm not, I'm not uh, going to be waiting to complete the set before I have a coffee table. Super nice. And I suppose, um within the area that, that you work in, <laughs> in the design side of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, do you find that you're always on the lookout for these types of, of products or these types of business models that exemplify maybe something that yeah, you're working on as well? Definitely. And, and, I, and that's probably how I got, I'm not, I'm, I work on design, as you say, um, but I'm not a designer by training. Um, I was kind of drawn to it through just, uh, as you, I, like, like you mentioned, I've been working with the foundation for 10 years and, and when we started out on this and circular economy wasn't really a, a very well-known term, people would come and say, well, where can I like buy circular economy products? And the sort of sad answer back then was there, were, well, there aren't really very many out there at the moment. And the exciting thing now in the past 10 years is that we've seen that really grow. Um, and there's many more options for people, a lot around packaging and, and things like that um but but in more and more parts of our of our daily life we have a chance to um engage with this concept of a circular economy and to bring it to life and um and, and i'm still personally quite discerning like the reason i like that is that it's um it's not about recycling i think a lot of people when they think circular economy they just think it's uh just about taking some old rubbish and turning it into something new which you know, recycling is part of the picture, but it's a tiny part of what we, what we really mean by a circular economy, which is, um, uh, in terms of the things we use, really providing those in a completely different way. So the reason that I, I picked those table legs is that they, it's a durable item, but it, it means that I'll be able to customize a product to meet my, my needs, which means I'll probably love it a bit more and hang on to it for a bit longer because I have that emotional attachment to it. Um, it's really convenient. If I need to move a coffee table and put it in the back of a car or and we're moving house soon, um, it'll be a bit easier to, to shift. And also, if we want to get a bit more kind of um, philosophical about it, it, it gets us into this, it like questions this um, notion of production and consumption. I'm not just a sort of a, a passive consumer of something that some conglomerate has churned out. I get to have a say in it and say like, you know, I want a bit of reclaimed wood from my local area, or I want to, I know a carpenter, I wonder if he's got an, an off cut that I can use. I, that I get to, to have a bit of a say. And, and to me, that's a, that's an important um, message and, and one that's really relevant today. On that kind of aspect of, of seeing, you know, also from your own experience, you're changing of kind of wants and needs and relationships with, with objects or products or businesses. What do you see in 2021, I think you've probably got quite a good world overview potentially of some of the interesting trends, um, whether it's kind of behaviors to, to business models or, or you know, particular areas within the circular economy. What do you see, um, putting you on the spot really, what's your prediction <laughs> <laughs> well, for I 2021? Guess... I guess it's a, a bit about what I, I'd like to see and I have to filter the things I'd like to see versus the things I think we actually will see. But I, I think um, we're going to see much 
I see businesses um, taking more of a stand about the value that they provide and um, and and shifting from which we've seen for a few years now, but but we're going to increasingly see businesses um, shifting from thinking let's just minimize not or not talk about or try and minimize the bad stuff we do um and shifting to well what's the actual positive thing positive impact that we can have um and that idea has been around for a while so one of the first businesses i worked with after joining the foundation was kingfisher who owned b and q and their, their their big campaign at the time was net positive i don't know if they um still use that i i found a bag for life at my mum's house the other day that said net positive on it i think i must have given it to her back in the day and it was a bit crusty so i don't know if that campaign's still running but that notion i think is it deserves more attention because you know we've paused the global economy um through the pandemic effectively and i think we know that emissions didn't they didn't, didn't fall enough and, and and actually we need to do way more than just like well, stopping everything isn't really an option and it might not even be enough to meet the scale of the challenges we need so we need more businesses taking a step and saying well what can we actively do to to be regenerative i think you mentioned that that word earlier i know you, you're focusing a bit on on food at the, at the moment and that's that'll be one i brought along a second thing if i was allowed to i, I, we'll let you, we'll let you. I didn't buy this <laughs> because of this but the, this tea that i got the other day kib i'd never heard of it before but they um they talk about their circular growing model and and then and they say on the back we grow our herbs in a regenerative way that creates better soil better plants and better flavor so they're not saying we want to minimize our waste minimize our impact they say they want to have a, a positive impact and maybe that's a bit easier to do when you're talking about food and farming systems but but i, th I think we're going to see more businesses stepping up and being proud of the positive things that they do and um, one thing I just wanted to pick on was, was almost that that change in citizens' awareness and behaviour change that potentially is supporting businesses that had great ideas like Kingfisher or for quite a lot have had circular economy ideas or products for a while, but not necessarily like the pool <laughs> or, um, from, from people understanding about it. Um, and around that, within your, your role as circular design lead, what do you look at in supporting designers who who have great circular products or ideas that maybe have trouble within the larger big businesses they're in yeah or you know trying to to find the market really to understand um, the benefits of it well we well we don't look that much at the the pull factors i mean they are important but i i, I can't help but get away from this notion that i i didn't start like um yeah, I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I wasn't born like wanting a new pair of Nikes every six months or something like that. Like that was manufactured by, by, by a lot of things, right? And there was a great series on TV a few years ago called The Men Who Made Us Spend. And it was like, the, I guess, the sort of real was a documentary equivalent to sort of Mad Men, like post-war um, consumption drive. And I think like, we so there's that, that 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 notion of like who who like demand for, is it demand from consumers pull from consumers or or kind of manufactured demand from advertising and, and brands which um is yeah it's, it's 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 not just consumer led is what i'm saying and i think the it makes me think well if if advertising can be so powerful and brands are so can be so powerful to make us behave in certain ways negative ways then if we could shift that to positive outcomes then that's that's hugely profound and and I, I would hope for people in that world and designers marketeers and so on that they would see that as an opportunity to have a really positive legacy to to, to the other part of your question around well how do we support designers I think we try and um, inspire them with with stories like really prof profound stories not just of a product that contains um 10 recycled content but of a an offering which completely reimagines the relationship between the the brand and the customer or, or renting something rather than owning it outright so inspire people with radically different stories provide them with some tools and resources so they can get started so we produced something called the circular design guide a few years ago to help people get started in that but those are kind of the easy bits i think in big businesses the harder bit is is 
the internal sort of ecosystem yeah. for the designer and how they um, are either supported and encouraged to experiment. Uh, I mean, I can think of organizations I've worked with over the years who had like the best um, concept, circular concepts on a post-it note in a, in a workshop, but it didn't get any further than that. It just ended there. And I think for that, we need kind of culture shifts in, in organizations and they need to be able to nurture and support, support a new circular economy innovation. Yeah, I, uh, we've got quite a few designers I see in, in the, the room. <laughs> so, um, yeah, they'll definitely empathise with uh, with that feeling of, of the designs not, not getting taken up and, and how to kind of get the stakeholders on board as well. Oh, I've got a dog as well. Sorry about the dog. Yeah, my dog's <laughs> a bit like your dog, actually. Small, black and noisy. Yeah. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, but, you know, like, uh, just to, to follow, the one concept I saw a few years ago or in a workshop with a with a fmcg brand was for a refillable deodorant um uh, and just this week i mean other, i think there, there are probably some out there but just this week i think dove announced a refillable deodorant by the uh dutch design agency van berlo um and it's beautiful it's like it's i mean it's like a a beautiful durable element that you keep and, and cherish and then a an a the bit that you dispose of or that gets used that, that comes in refillable cartridges and um sometimes it takes a little while for those those ideas to, to to percolate and for the organization to get around to um to understand that it's the way forward yeah i think what you often almost see is that some of these big companies observe smaller businesses or the you know the, the smaller innovation kind of startups or things and then see how they go or, or um, waiting until it's ready as well. Um, I know that there's going to be loads of different questions from people as well, but my last question before we um, hand over and, and, and see what else uh, people would like to chat about is if we, me and Sophie, could invite anyone on or a particular theme. You were one of <laughs> the requests previously, we said, or, or something from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, but what kind of area would you be really interested on for us yeah. to get a chat about? I thought, what about someone for, involved in the ready bike um, uh, model? Uh, the, yeah. the, the, the bike sharing docks that now look quite sort of sad and empty. Um, and I think I, last time I saw a ready bike, it was on top of a barge down by Horseshoe Bridge. I think it had just been fished out of the river. Um, but, you know, this is, it's not easy, like the, the, piloting these new models. Um, and... Um, a colleague of mine, Ken Webster, once said a pioneer, definition of a pioneer is someone face down in the mud with an arrow in their back or something like that. And, you know, there's, it, it, it is a creative process and, and we need, we need experimentation, but I'd love to know like what happened with that. What, what could we learn from ready bike, bike sharing that, that model that, that, that could tell us about mobility systems in Reading? Um, cause it should be obviously such a bike friendly town. I think we, we, we know that in terms of, well, there are not many Hills, which I appreciate. Um, but then was it the design of the bikes? Like, were they easy to repair? Was it about the, the sort of natural movement of people and you ended up with lots of bikes in one place and at different times of day and sort of load balancing type thing? Was it economics, like the funding? Um, probably, <laughs> um, but I'd love to know a bit more about that. Ooh, we'll, we'll, I think transport is a whole area actually that we've yeah. not really touched upon. Yeah, so that and, and I'm a I'm a big bad bike fan as well. <laughs> so we need a we need an electric bike startup also like in, in London that leaves them, but not too many around, um, which is an interesting well, cause, cause issue. It, also, you're right. It's like you. I was I spent a bit of time in Austin um, f for work, and uh, there's like six or seven different electric scooter companies in that in that city and it is bonkers they're everywhere people falling over them and and nearly getting run down by them and it's it's a there's a there's and then you, you've probably seen these mountains of disposed dockless bikes mm. in in china and they're electric they're, they're as you say they're electric and proprietary so they can't be resold or reused and there's so many different dimensions to this and and it shows that 
these circular business models, like they still need scrutiny. Um, they, they're not, it's not a magic bullet. Yeah, that really interesting area to end on as well is that, that wider aspect around understanding the benefits of the circular business model, all the changes, do they produce potentially unintended <laughs> consequences as well? Um, I know Sophie's been keeping an eye on the chat and there's been quite yeah. a few questions flowing on. So I'll pass yeah. it to Sophie now to, to pick up. We do have a few and I think there's one, the, the last one actually links brilliantly to that. Um, the question, hold on, let me pick it up. Um, from Amanda, basically, who was asking about how designer make convenience uh, choices on limited information. So, for example, we know that the plastic square wine bottle uses less space for transportation, but is it really better? Um, so, was wondering what's what's your view on this one? Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a it's the it's kind of the big question for designers, and for me. I try and encourage designers to come back to um, the principles and the, the kind of, it sounds a bit sort of um, maybe too grand, but the vision of the sort of future that they want to contribute towards or their business wants to contribute towards. And the reason I say it like that is um, that just looking at the at data can, can be, be misleading. And an example that we sometimes use, sometimes use is electric vehicles. Um, currently, I, th I think most people today would agree that a, a, a future of electrified um, mobility powered by renewable energy is desirable, like we, 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 is, a, is a desirable future. Um, currently, comparing a combustion engine with an with a electric vehicle, I, I, I'm, I understand that um, a combustion engine probably performs a bit better on a life cycle assessment currently. Um, but if you just went off that, you would and, and said, well, let's stick to that in 20, 30 years time, you'd probably end up just with a more efficient combustion engine. So I think that's why we, we try, try and encourage people to come back to, well, what are the principles or values that you want to design around? So to use the, the, the wine bottle one, um, is it about saying, well, we don't want to use um, uh, pl plastic packaging? or we, we don't want to use um, packaging derived from fossil fuels, or we, we want to make sure all our packaging is refillable. So coming back to some, some principles, and, 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 and that might mean writing out some of the data that, that, is, that can, be a, can be a distraction at times. And, and I understand that for those working in bigger businesses who maybe have, have gravitated towards the more sort of tempting or easier to measure metrics, that it, it is quite challenging to work in that environment. But um, we do encourage people to come back to the, the, the kind of values-led innovation. I really like that. And actually, then it's not just replacing something for a sort of slightly better version, but it's truly innovating in it. Yeah, I think it, you could, <laughs> it could encourage you to, if you just want to play with the numbers, like you could yeah. probably come up with a model that works, but is, is like okay. not really a stepping stone to a, a, a circular economy. Yeah, yeah, no, fantastic. There was another question around, um, is the inertia of large organization a bar year compared to smaller businesses? Um, sorry, whereabouts was that one? Is the inertia? Sorry, okay. yeah, yeah. Probably was my French <laughs> No, it's fine, no, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so is the inertia of large organization a bar year compared to smaller businesses, you think? I don't know. I mean, yes, I think that's the, that's the, that's what we should say, right? That it, it's harder, the, the old, fuel uh, cargo ship analogy like it takes a while to turn around sort of thing um but I, i've i've spoken to some um smaller businesses over the years and and it they quite quickly get um sort of drawn into the same sort of um patterns uh of of, of production and, and consumption and 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 the sort of linear model that, that the bigger businesses do i, I mean Last year, um, uh, I spoke with the company Allbirds. I don't know if you know them. They make um, uh, shoes out of natural materials. That they, I mean, they're bigger now, um, but but they they started they're a startup still. Um, but they they st they still have to grapple with some of the challenges that an established producer does, like um, supply like supply chains and. Um, once you start producing something at any sort of scale, there are certain efficiencies and 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 experimenting outside of those um, uh, 
outside of the sort of expense that you've sunk to set up a reliable and efficient supply chain um, is becomes hard. So, yeah, I think if you're starting from a blank slate, sure, it's, you can you can be creative. But I want I think actually the the sort of realities of running a, a business probably set in quite quickly. I've not done it myself, not not as much as the folks on this call, but I, I imagine those sort of realities of running a business, having customers, having employees, they come in fairly quickly, no matter if you're 10, 10 employees or a thousand. Oh, fantastic, thank you for that. <laughs> um, just a quick one, over. we were wondering, you know, if there is a um, sort of a story about redesign that you really like, maybe in a food one, is there anything that you would like to share with us? What's your favorite? Um, I mean, there's one that springs to mind from, uh, from uh, my early days at, at the foundation when we were doing um, more sort of educational, we still have a, a, a learning team, but um, we were doing more activity directly in schools. And um, our CEO, a guy called Jamie Butterworth, um, went into a class of, of students who had been, they'd probably been told that they were going to have some talk about sustainability or something like that. Um, and he went in, uh, and didn't say anything. Um, he was introduced and he just went in and put a, a glass of water on the desk, um, picked up a plastic bag, dunked it in the water, stirred it around a bit and then drank, drank it. Um, and I mean, the kids weren't to know at the time, but, but that, that bag was made of a, a dissolvable, um, dissolvable film. Um, but it's, it was completely kind of mind blowing, blowing and turned upside down their preconceptions of, of what um, sort of sustainable innovation looks like, I guess, is, is the, how, maybe how they came, came into it. Um, and and th that one springs to mind just because it's, I, I find it really inspiring that, that part of what, what is, is, gr is great about this topic is it, it makes people question the actions that they could take as designers or as businesses to um, create the sort of future that we want to live in, in terms of all the products and things that we use. But then specifically, um, if we think about a specific item, like, I mean, I've got some here, I had some sesame snaps this morning, this tiny piece of packaging, <laughs> yeah. as soon as it's done, it doesn't need to last that long, but as soon as it's finished, it's a waste problem. But if we, if we could reimagine it as a, um, as, as a potential benefit, a tiny one, admittedly, but something that could return to an, a natural system, or if it ended up in the sea, it wasn't a problem. If it was a positive, it'd be amazing. If it was fish food, it'd be awesome, right? Mm -hmm. But if it, even if it just dissolved and and we didn't have to worry about it anymore, that's that that I think is a is a is a is an inspiring thought. And um, we're we're looking a bit more in detail these days. At um, we look as you know probably know we we look a lot of plastic packaging through our projects called new plastics economy um, but looking at these sachets and small formats and and the things that just they never get recycled they just they don't get collected um they're too small um and and such low value that and and, and then on top of that their the sachet of ketchup is not just one material it's like a bunch of different materials layered um so they're a huge recycling problem and we're gonna have to as a society and industry expend a lot of energy rethinking those and reimagining them in the coming years um but there's a i think the the solutions are are, are really inspiring fantastic thank you i love how it's like the mind blowing but also really challenging us as a consumer to behave differently because you know looking at drinking a what seems to be a plastic uh, wrapper and so on you wouldn't even dream about it at first but then all of a sudden it's like, ah makes sense yeah and when i said he was our former ceo yeah. he left a bit he left he didn't like yeah. he didn't the, the, yeah. he didn't die from the bag yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good thing yeah. uh, right just uh, i'm gonna pick it there's one more question from paul actually who said he just attended a webinar on the six carbon budgets and the net zero um, there was quite an emphasis on consum sorry, consumption emission. How much is it a driving ch a change, um, especially in the circular economy? Yeah, so we, yeah, we did a report on this uh, two years ago, no, 18 months ago, something like that, um, called, the, um, com called Completing the Picture. And it basically, the, the, the conclusion of that was that... Um, efficiency energy efficiency and renewables which get a lot of attention and 
that's great. Um, they are about 55% of the, um, the, the change and the salute, the, the, the sort of whole picture of the solution that we need to uh, um, keep climate change within um, uh, agreed international targets, um, 55%. The, for, the remaining 45% of what we called hard to abate emissions um, are about how we make a new stuff and how we produce our food and how we manage land. And, and that's where circular economy comes in. And it's, I mean, we, we released that report and it received some attention, but it's massively overlooked. And, and if you just think about kind of buildings and cars and things like that, if we could start sort of using them doubly as intensively. I mean, uh, probably a, a stat you, you may have heard before, um, the average car is sits idle for something like 92% of the time. Like that's a huge amount of effort and emissions that are embedded in that product that is sat doing nothing. And certainly for the past year, it's been a lot more than 92% of the time, I can tell you. So um, it's a huge topic. It needs it needs more, more attention that, that People need to know that the way that we that we make and use things is a source of emission, not just what comes out of a chimney uh, or, um, or or energy production. Fantastic. Right, there are so many other questions, but we're really running out of time. So what I'll do is like maybe I'll pick if there is one or two, Joe. Maybe we can. I don't know if I can be cheeky and say, could we pass them on to you? And you got like um, like five minutes, literally, just bring us in. So it's really amazing. But yeah yeah go for it yeah um I, lots of good ones I, and yeah i know um perpetual um in twice yeah. i play squash with vivek who is who uh is involved with that um <laughs> he, he frequently turns up in plastic suits and things like that um <laughs> upcycling pt yeah it's a big big topic i'd love love to get into that um but yeah happy happy for you to send a couple through I'll do that. I'll save that. But um, yeah, I wanted to say a massive thank you. Really inspirational. I loved how you you talked about so many things, looking at different misconceptions, engaging client customers, all the emotional attachments we can have. I mean, there's so many topics there. So thank you so much for taking the a pleasure. business today. Um, for everyone um, on the call, so we will run uh, this one again in two weeks' time and, and for the forthcoming future. I've added in the chat um, the link to basically our newsletter, but it's just sending you information about the circular coffee uh, conversation and, uh, and circular initiatives that are happening in Reading. Um, so if you'd like to sign up, you're very welcome to do that. Um, and I think that's it from us. A very big thank you to everyone and have a lovely day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.